Welcome tonight to tonight's online event from the British Library. Black to the Future presents Imaginary Cities with M.K. Jemison and Victor Laval in conversation with Renaton Okoji. Uh, this is the latest event in a series accompanying the British Library's exhibition, Fantasy Realms of Imagination, which is running in the gallery here until 25th of February. Uh, we've been delighted by the public response to this exhibition, which showcases a, a wonderful array of fantasy fiction, including works by tonight's speakers, originals such as the Beowulf and Alice manuscripts, handwritten drafts by Angela Carter and Ursula K. Le Guin, artworks, costumes, games, videos, and fan perspectives. And when planning the programme, we were delighted to be approached by our chair tonight, Renaton Okoji, who was developing a new creative festival under the title Black to the Future, which is described as an Afrofuturist celebration of outstanding Black artists and a space for visionary imaginings to thrive. It was a wonderful moment of serendipity, and tonight's conversation is just one of a range of collaborations that emerged between the festival and the British Library's fantasy program. Black to the Future and tonight's event are also collaborations with the Royal Society of Literature, which is a fantastic organization, which I urge you to find out more about. I would also like to express our sincerest thanks to our friends at the United States Embassy here in London, whose support has made this event with Nora and Victor and others in the series possible. And also our partners, the Eccles Center for American Studies here at the British Library. And before I hand over to the speakers, I might would like to remind you that you can put your questions to them by using the form below the video window. And we'll read out some of the best of these later on. Uh, you can also buy their books by using the tab at the top of the screen. And finally, a word of introduction to our chair, Arenison Okoji, who is the author of award-winning novel, Butterfly Fish and short story collections, Speak Gigantula and Nuda Branch, and the forthcoming novel, Curandera. And apart from being the founder and director of Black to the Future, she is vice chair of the Royal Society of Literature and was awarded an MBE for services to literature in 2021. So it's over to Arenison and please enjoy the event. Thank you, John, for that lovely introduction. I'm delighted to be in conversation with two incredible authors whose works traverse the speculative genre, including fantasy, sci-fi, and horror, offering us rich in insights into the human experience whilst moving between worlds and realms. I'd like to introduce them without further ado. N.K. Jemison is the first author in the genre's history to win three consecutive Best Novel Hugo Awards for her Broken Earth trilogy, her work has also won the Nebula and Locus Awards, and she's a 2020 MacArthur Fellow. She's been an instructor for Clarion and Clarion West writing workshops. Amongst other critical work, she was formerly the science fiction and fantasy book reviewer at the New York Times. Her speculative works range from fantasy to science fiction to the undefinable. Her themes include resistance to oppression, the inseverability of the liminal, and the coolness of stuff blowing up. <laughs> Victor Laval is the author of seven works of fiction, four novels, two novellas, and a collection of short stories. His novels have been included in best of the year lists by the New York Times Book Review, Los Angeles Times, the Washington Post, Chicago Tribune, The Nation, and Publishers Weekly, amongst others. He has been the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship, an American Book Award, the Shirley Jackson Award, and the Key to South East Queens. He lives in the Bronx with his wife and kids and teaches at Columbia University. Um, welcome both. So thrilled um, to have you guys joining us to have this conversation. Uh, let's jump straight in. Um, NK, talk about your intentions behind your brilliant Great City series, where each borough of New York um, is represented as a human avatar. And it's about the soul of cities, essentially, but it's also full of big ideas, magic, mystery, and a commentary on present day politics. So I wonder if you could talk about your vision for this hugely um, ambitious work and what your intentions were. Um, mostly I needed a palate cleanser after the heaviness and, and the darkness of writing the Broken Earth series. I wanted to write something fun and a little silly. Um, so, you know, I'm a big fan of uh, like 
Japanese giant robot shows. And, uh, and I had this vision in my head of New York as a giant robot fighting Cthulhu. And of course, <laughs> I, I, I had to write that. Um, and also, you know, kind of a lot of it derives from uh, just me traveling. Uh, when I travel, a lot of times when I go to a, a city I've never been to before, I have a kind of quicker instant sense of um, whether I would be happy in that city, whether that city is is a good place for me, um, whether there's a good personality match between us, basically. Um, and it feels to me like the city judges. <laughs> um, maybe that's just how my head works, but uh, it feels to me like the city immediately sends a, a, a signal of, you know, um, yeah, okay, you could, you could, you could hack it here. We, we, we'd be okay with you being here. Or no, I don't like you. Go away. <laughs> um, and you know, I felt uh, welcomed in London. I felt welcomed in a few yeah. cities so far, um, and felt strongly pushed out of other cities like Boston. Anyway, um, so, <laughs> but uh, anyway, so that was it. I just tried to, to make that a real thing. That's really interesting. We'll try not to shade Boston. <laughs> <laughs> I shade Boston all the time. I, they deserve I, uh, it. We, we, we won't do it. We won't do it on air. But it's really interesting what you know <laughs> about cities having um, a personality and that they judge. I mean, it really does feel like that. You know, certain cities you immediately um, form a connection with. Um, you immediately feel at home or a sense of anticipation about what's possible and um, other cities, not so much. Uh, and that really is a, com a combination, I think, of the space and, and the people as well and the kind of sense of atmosphere. So it's really interesting mm -hmm. to kind of interrogate what cities represent and how they can make you feel, especially as somebody who's who's creative. You know, we need that stimulation. We need stimulation from space and places and and people and um, cities are such rich fodder for that. So, um, and when you were talking about, I think you said Japanese robot <laughs> shows. Uh, I mean, so much of that is so wacky and completely makes sense um, given your work. So it's interesting you're drawing from all these different influences uh, that really have, 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 yeah, resulted in this amalgamation um, that's that's absolutely fascinating and brilliant. Victor, I want to come to you next. Um, the both the Changeling and the Ballad of Black Tom wonderfully blur um, the boundaries of genre. I think um, in both New York is just it's replete with ancient and modern day horrors, as well as the kind of um, disruptive technological elements. Did you have a sense of that? You know, when you were exploring the idea, that duality or from the beginning, or did that develop as you worked on the book? Because it's really interesting whether or not a writer has the idea and it's fully formed or that kind of develops as you continue to write and more comes to you. Uh, well, in the case of the Changeling in particular, um, I knew I wanted it to be a to a, the, a fairy tale in New York, right? Uh, but I also um, I sometimes get frustrated when I'm like watching a movie, reading a book, watching a show, whatever it is, where uh, essentially where the creator throws out the technology and, you know, on some level, it's just because it's too difficult to deal with it. Right. To to put them together. So it'll be a fairy tale in New York. But uh, for some reason, nobody uses their cell phones or something like that. Right. Uh, and so I thought, like, maybe there's a way to lean into that and. Uh, make use of that technology and and make use of the juxtaposition of those two things that would actually be more interesting to take uh like to my mind a fairy tale the idea of there being little people who snatch babies is easily as strange as the idea that every single one of us has a computer that could have launched a nuclear weapon 20 years ago you know uh they're both really bizarre really fantastical and i just thought like if i put them together then i also get the fun of um you know uh using that technology in a way where people kind of just feel the joy and the surprise of like oh i didn't think i didn't think you could find a way to make that part of the fairy tale of it all but uh uh i i, I felt excited by that idea like uh people can call each other certainly and we won't have them drop the calls but there'll be some other problem that makes things go wrong, you know? Um, and uh, so for me, right from the beginning, I knew I wanted to blend the two. I didn't necessarily know from the start how they would blend, uh, you know? Um, but I thought there was something, you know, taking the trope and adding in the th adding in that, that other thing made it feel like this will make the book also feel more particular, you know, more specific. 
Yeah, absolutely. And in a way, kind of creating a new space almost, because like you said, those two ideas, the idea of um, the fable and then the technological, you don't necessarily put them together. When I think of fables, I think of old world fairy tales, right. perhaps new takes on them, refreshing takes on them, but not in terms of technology. So it's it's really interesting that you're blending the two um, and finding a way to like, how do you do that? I'm interested in how you actually do that. You know, how do you have the confidence you know, you have the idea, but how do you actually have the confidence to to mix those two things? Because they're very, very different things, and it it may not necessarily work on the page sometimes. So, I'm really right. interested by how you were able to do that so convincingly. Oh well, I mean, let me say what you see is the final book, <laughs> so you get to see. There have been several drafts. <laughs> yes, multiple drafts. Where, in particular, I have an editor who will say. I don't believe this at all. We have a long <laughs> relationship. So he really will tell me straight out, like, I don't buy it. This ain't mm -hmm. working, whatever it is. Uh, so, you know, one of the joys, uh, but also one of the uh, pitfalls of like being a writer who reads other writers, you know, there's that mistake. I, I often used to make that mistake of thinking that finished book is like what it always was. Mm -hmm. They always knew how to make these things happen. Uh, and the joy of becoming a writer is saying, Oh, of course not. Of course, it took 15 drafts and right. 10 different paths. And then mm -hmm. finally stumbling into the moment where the tech works with the fairy tale. And my editor says, that's it now. And I go, OK. And then in that same draft, the next version, the next way I try to blend the two fails miserably. And then mm -hmm. that's the next draft. Right. And that, that's the writing process. That's so hugely encouraging, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of our audience listening, I'm hearing Victor Laval say that. Um, a, a writer friend of mine once said, you've got to be in it to get to the gold. You've got to keep going through those drafts to get to that spot and that place where everything kind of blends together and works. So, yeah, it's really it's really um, wonderful to hear you say that. Um, I want to talk now a little bit about what makes a city interesting to you both um, and how you expand on these ideas. We touched on it briefly. Um, so for me, um, spaces that really spark the imagination, um, a sense of belonging, a place where you can also reinvent yourself for me, I think is, is important because we all have different versions of ourselves <laughs> at different periods in our lives. Um, and also places where subcultures form. I'm, I'm really interested in that. So I'll come to you first, Nora. What makes a city interesting to you and, and how do you go about exploring that in your work? Um, for me, it's a combination of the physicality of the city. Um, I've found that I'm I'm fascinated by older cities um, or, or cities where there's a, a solid blend of the old and the new. Um, you know, I was recently in an American city, I won't name which one, but you could just kind of tell that a lot of it had just grown up very recently. Everything was strip malls and, you know, it just didn't have any, any depth to it. Um, and then I, many years ago, I went on a vacation to Chiaca in uh, Italy and it's a thousand year old city and you could feel it. You could just feel the weight of, of all those years on the stones, on the people, on the culture. Um, so that combo of old and new, the subcultures like you're you're describing, um, a big one for me is uh, unique aspects of culture that are that that city will develop. Um, so like this is not new unique to New York, um, but a thing that typically happens in New York is that whenever there is a citywide problem like a a blackout or something like that, um, New Yorkers will, you'll just find people standing in the street directing traffic. You'll just find people, uh, you know, going uh, on their bikes to pick up food for elders and shut-ins in their buildings, um, you know, going up the steps because the elevators aren't working. This is just a New York thing where people, that's not at all unique to New York. Many cities do that. That's human nature and it's a beautiful thing. Um, but, you know, people think that New York is such an unpleasant, unfriendly city. And I've found that it is possibly the most friendly city I've ever been in. 
Um, you know, I've been in lots of cities where people will will be nice to your face, will say positive things to you, um, but then not help you <laughs> if something goes wrong. In New York, they'll cuss you out, but they'll still help you. I love that. <laughs> um, so. I love that. Cuss you out, but still help you. Also, what you said about the the mixture of the old and the new. I was thinking of. Um, I did a residency um, last year in Barcelona, and I felt exactly that way about it. I mean, it's such a gorgeous city. Uh, the architecture is amazing. That mix of the old and new, it's so lively. Even the even the Primark building is beautiful there. I was like, even even shopping buildings are gorgeous there. And and, and just, just, oh, it was just so wonderful. So I, I completely uh, understand what you're saying about, about that combination. Victor, how about for you? Um, what makes a city interesting? Um, what are the things that stand out to you and sort of help spark your imagination when you're writing about cities or trying to expand the ideas around um, what place can feel like, what setting can feel like? Well, I mean, one, I'm 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 biased because I grew up in New York City. I grew up in a city. And so there's a part of me that uh, thinks of it not as uh, foreign territory or unnatural territory or anything like that. Right. And uh, I think one thing that's in in my mind sometimes in writing, I've written about really only in the end two cities, New York and Oakland. And it's because I've lived in both, you know, um, and one of the things that I'm always thinking about drawn to is the idea that cities are not part of the natural world, right? Like there's a bias, this idea that like a more rural uh, space is the natural world, but that cities are somehow uh, divorced from the natural world. And I really push back, kick back against that idea because the world is the world as far as I'm concerned, right? And uh, and all, all of the world is in some way plugged into nature, into the, the larger sort of ecosystem of the of the world and i love uh in particular in my uh writing about new york trying to find the ways that i can talk about those attachments talk about the lost islands or the forgot the, the 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 secret islands uh in the east river um uh talk about like the the, the largest forest in all of new york city is in queens it's forest park um uh and talk about these uh write about rather these ways that the natural world sort of pops up and does change and um, and and build the, the human beings who live there. It's just that what you also get to have is speaking about New York, but certainly any major city will have this anywhere in the world. You have all these other worlds essentially brought to you. Right. You have all these other cultures bring their worlds to you. Uh, and I grew up in Queens, which is incredibly diverse. And one of the joys of living there was block to block. I I could, in theory, I could travel the planet. At least it felt that way as a kid. Uh, and I really felt like I was immersed. And even like in my building where I grew up, apartment to apartment. I was growing up. I was I had my apartment, but then I would I visit my friend who's Korean. I I visit his Korean family, then I visit my Persian friend, then I visit my Colombian friend, and then on and on and on. And that's just one building, you know. Uh, and so uh, I find myself often almost trying to make a case for the idea that, uh, uh, for lack of better terms, like you people in the country, you don't have a a, a, a monopoly on <laughs> nature. <laughs> and on knowing nature and being affected by nature. Maybe I have a little chip on my shoulder about it is what it sounds like. But uh, but it's the truth. But it's true. I, it's yeah. true. Yeah, it's true. I like that you have a chip on your shoulder about, <laughs> about, about we're nat we're nature too. Yeah, we, yeah. we explore nature too here in the city and the find <laughs> ways to bring that um into into your work. Um on that topic, on that topic of of finding ways to do that, how do you subvert expectations of what settings can look and feel like um Victor you touched on it you touched on I like that you mentioned you know um bringing the natural world in and um sort of hidden things that people may not necessarily be uh aware of hidden natural aspects um because I think sometimes there, there are expectations of what Black writers can write about, and we mm -hmm. are often expected to write urban settings, but mm -hmm. not the way you guys do it. <laughs> <laughs> you guys have completely taken that to a whole nother stratosphere, which is 
amazing um, and incredibly inspiring. Um, so I wondered if you could talk about that. I mean, do you are you actively aware of trying to be subversive um, in terms of doing things like that, or is it something that just kind of comes naturally? I wouldn't say it comes naturally. I would say for me, like um, just a writing rule in general that I believe in is that uh, nothing in nothing in real life is cliched, right? No human being, no place, no thing. Uh, that cliche is a way to sort of flatten a person or a place or a thing, right? And that anything that is well observed suddenly becomes particular. Right. Uh, like uh, so the I'm sorry. I said, what a beautiful way to phrase that. Thank you. Oh, I appreciate that. Uh, you know, the and the thing I think of is like uh, so uh, speaking of living in other cities um, years ago, uh, 12 years ago now, uh, my wife and I, I got a fellowship and we we got to move to Amsterdam for five months. And we lived in Amsterdam for five months. I love the city very much and uh, and have been back once or twice. And it's a, such a beautiful place. Uh, but one of the things that was a marvel to me was, uh, so, you know, you're walking along the canals and there are these just glorious townhouses, like right along the water, uh, um, beautiful, I'm sure multi-million dollar homes or, or whatever they are. And one of the things that I started to notice was as we were walking around at night, the families who owned them, they would be eating dinner, but they would have these 10, 12, 20 foot windows. The curtains would be open so people could see inside while they're eating their dinner and all this, right? And while they're having parties and all this. And I was, my wife and I, we were so, uh, as Americans maybe or whatever, we were like, why do they do that or whatever? And uh, our we had a Dutch friend. Uh, I want to specify that so that it was a Dutch person who told me this, right? who said, oh, they want you to see how well they're doing, but don't go and don't knock on that door and ask to share a meal. Please don't do that. Uh, and it was interesting to me as a cultural, like suggestion, feeling like uh, to Nora's point, the American version or maybe the New York version of that is, don't look inside my apartment, but if you really need something, of course, I'll give it to you, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so in that way, I suddenly, when I, when she, ex when our Dutch friend explained that to us as a, as a general, as almost like a general custom of the folks who lived along there, I so suddenly started to notice when we were out in the evenings, every other house along the canals, those windows were open, the people were eating. And it's suddenly, I, re I realized like, oh, I'm supposed to look, mm -hmm. I'm supposed to appreciate. Mm -hmm. And then there was also a way that says like, and I'm supposed to not knock <laughs> right don't you're not welcome in but you can look in and that was beautiful and specific and suddenly i felt like i understood at least this particular segment of the dutch mm -hmm. in an all new way that i you know that my cliched version would not have been able to understand if i didn't get someone to explain you know right. yeah what a beautiful cultural exchange in a way to be able to observe that and also get it <laughs> yes somebody <laughs> had to tell me because if you didn't you know you might make the mistake and think, yeah, oh, I... they want me to come in and approach. that's right this looks right. like a fun party am i can i come no <laughs> we do not know you yes just watch <laughs> fascinating i i see something similar in new york sometimes i'm mm -hmm. um, like you know the the brownstones right around uh washington square park for example um, in New York, they open the windows and they let you see the house, but you don't see people. You never see people. The windows are only open when there's no one around. It's right. like they want you to see the, the material goods, but not the family, not the events, not the emotions. So mm -hmm. that's the thing. I wonder what that means about right. New York. They want to show yeah, up. Right. They're like, look what we have, but, but not us. But not us. <laughs> yeah, there's a, it's like, because they're also not owning... Yeah. the truth of it then right mm -hmm. like uh you're not going to say mm -hmm. we're the rich people right you're just going to say there are rich people here yes right, right. Yeah. disembodied yeah. third person the, the, right. the physicality <laughs> of it yeah that's so interesting Boys. rich no, people how, <laughs> yes they so how about, right how about, how about for you um how do you feel you subvert um expectations of what settings and place can look like in your in your work I think I just try to write the reality of what I see versus that that cliche that Victor's talking about, that cliche that so many people expect. 
Um, you know, when I decided to write the Great Cities books, for example, um, you know, I left Manhattan almost immediately. Um, and whenever you see movies or TV shows or something about New York, 99% of the time you just see Manhattan. You see really a small section of Manhattan. Um, it's, it's almost like the other four fifths of the city doesn't exist. <laughs> Um, and, you know, I wanted to show that that Queens diversity, which is even greater than the rest of, you know, Brooklyn's not like that. Mm -hmm. um, Brooklyn, it's, it's you know, neighborhoods uh, are, are diverse, you know, kind of you see that diversity from block to block, not within the same building. That's more of a Queens thing. I wanted to show that when I depicted Queens. I wanted to show the reality that I have seen, the New York that I have known and loved. Um, you know, and I've written about several cities at this point, uh, Birmingham, Alabama, New Orleans, where I lived for a while. Um, and that's the thing that I always try to do is get away from the tourist areas, get away from whatever you know that your audience has been bludgeoned with. Um, you right. know, New York in particular, the audience has been bludgeoned with Manhattan. Very few people have seen Staten Island. A lot of people don't even know Staten Island exists. Uh, people in New York don't know Staten Island. <laughs> Staten Island almost feels almost feels Terrible mythical to me different. sometimes. It's it, sorry. <laughs> Staten Island almost feels mythical to me sometimes when I when I see it on film and hear about it in books. I'm like, oh my god, yeah, this exists. It exists. It's real. <laughs> if so not for Wu Tang, a lot huh? of people still. If not for Wu Tang. Hello? There's still tons of people who wouldn't know. Exactly, exactly. I mean, it, even I had to deal with a lot of that myself because I hadn't been to Staten Island in years and I live in New York. So, you know, uh, it was important for me to show the reality of what I was in. Even though I'm writing fantasy, I try not to get the people or the realness wrong. Um, right. If you're going to riff on reality with fantasy, it helps if your reality is solid, is um, you know, has that that feel or that certain something that makes you understand that it is it is the actuality of of what you're saying, um, and that makes the fantasy go down easier, I think. Right. So you're talking about anchoring it essentially, you know, yes. anchoring it so that the reality is is there, so people recognize it, which makes the strangeness all the more effective and impactful so. when you mm -hmm. when you write about those elements. That's essentially what you're so. saying, right? Yeah, I think that when I'm about to knock down a bridge in New York uh, by having a metaphysical interdimensional tentacle swipe it, swipe through it, um, it helps if I use a bridge that not everybody's heard of. I use a bridge <laughs> that I like. The Williamsburg is my favorite bridge. I destroyed it immediately. Um, so, um, and that was the whole point is, you know, to, to show some realness. Absolutely. Um, Nora, in your Broken Earth trilogy, there's both the sense of wonder uh, and dread in this kind of vast alternate universe. Um, it explores a series of endings and earth shattered, family torn apart. Um, it's so intricate and um, beautifully uh, realized. Talk us through the process of building this because it is hugely ambitious. What were some of your references uh, and what challenges did you face? You know, it's, I had spent years uh, reading fantasy and wondering why I did not see more original fantasy worlds. Why so many of the fantasy worlds that I had seen were riffs on medieval Europe, endlessly, uh, medieval Japan, you know, just stuff that we had seen before with the, the serial numbers rubbed off and a dragon stuck in it. Um, and, and that was always boring to me. I, I find it more exciting to create a world from scratch. I, I don't think that it's easy, but I think that it is a thing that makes the fantasy richer to me because the world building is part of how you create your magic, your, uh, you know, your culture and those kinds of things. Um, so for me, it was really more a matter of, I wanted to see a world where, seismology was just off the chart. I wanted to see what people were like in a world like that, where, where natural disasters, uh, extinction level events happen on a regular basis. I wanted to see it so it, it needed to be created. Um, and I didn't find that particularly difficult to do because for me, that's just enjoyable. Now, you know, actually making a story to go in that world is the hard part. Um, the world building for me is always fun. Um, so yeah, it, it was just a combination of my own disparate interests in geophysics and, um, 
sociology and things like that form coming together and just sort of forming into what I needed. Amazing. Um, yeah, thank you so much for that. Uh, Victor, Lone Women spans historical California and Montana. Um, you know, the American West historically is normally presented as very white, a very white aesthetic. Um, I'm really fascinated by your centering of a black female protagonist in this in this setting, um, which makes the story to me feel fantastical, galvanizing, radical. Um, how did you go about reimagining that setting in a way that I think feels really authentic? Well, uh, thank you for that. I mean, I think the funny part is, uh, so I did an event at the, you know, a reading at the University of Montana and um, went into their bookstore like, um, uh, Oftentimes, if I do an event and I'm in a place that I think I might not come back to, I'll try to buy a book of local history so I, I can at least kind of understand the place I was, even if I didn't have, uh, like to Nora's point about like a city sort of telling you who they are, if I'm not there long enough to even get that feeling, it feels like, okay, let me understand a little history about the place. And so I went to the local bookshelf, local history bookshelf, and I found a book called Montana Women Homesteaders, uh, A Field of One's Own. Oh. And uh, I was fascinated by just the title alone, I was interested. And then I started to read it and I saw that it was specifically about lone women homesteaders, um, women who went alone to oh. Montana. They didn't come with a husband. They didn't come with a brother. They didn't come with anyone to co-sign them. And, uh, and at that time, the United States government was so desperate to have that land home homesteaded, largely because they had taken it away from all the indigenous population. And they wanted people there to basically be able to say like, no, 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 look, new people are there now, right? Mm -hmm. uh, um, as part of our history. Um, and so as a result, they relaxed the rules in a, in ways that were surprising to me for the time, 1900 to 1920s is what we're talking about. Uh, so the first thing was I was surprised that women could come alone and, uh, and claim land. Uh, and as a so small side note, uh, in Canada, who are usually, which is usually credited as being the much more liberal country, they could not do it by themselves. So that was like one for us in the long history of us falling short with yeah. rights. We got one. Uh, we were ahead of it on one. Um, but then the other thing, yes. <laughs> and then uh, the thing that was even more fascinating to me was that uh, when I started to see that there were black women homesteaders mm -hmm. there. And then... Uh, um, and then as I read and I saw that, and also Latinas uh, could come, Latin folks from like coming up from Mexico specifically, uh, were the folks who could also come and claim land, but Chinese people could not, and indigenous people could not. And all of this stuff was much more complex, much more culturally diverse, to use the term, uh, than I had any uh, understanding of at the time. Uh, and I thought maybe it was just me. Like I said, I'm just a kid raised in New York. Maybe all these folks in Montana knew all about these lone women of multiple uh, cultures and races. Uh, but then when I spoke to the folks who I'd met who were from Montana, they had never heard of them either. Uh, and that was when I thought like, oh, this is a book I could write. Mm -hmm. And so uh, one of the joys I took in writing the book, like, or one of the rules I had for myself was, there's one element in the story that is literally impossible, that is fantastical. But my rule for myself was every single other thing in this book is a has to be a fact. If somebody said to me, this couldn't have happened, or these people weren't there, or these people, uh, this, this event couldn't have happened, I would be able to take them to the newspapers of the period and say, look right here, here it is, here it is. So everything in that book is real, except for, you know, the one unreal thing. Um, and uh, and I took some pride in that because I did feel like exactly what you're saying. Uh, to many people, it would almost feel like, I imagined the like, oh, you know, he's bringing all his woke 21st century nonsense to the past. You know, he's, he's trying to change the past when um, the whole point was a concerted and specific effort was made to erase the true diversity of the past and is always the case, right? That Hollywood, America. television, books, movies, they hired people to play act like they were the people who lived there mm -hmm. and they decided who they looked like. Mm -hmm. And that's a 50 to 100 year effort to erase the real truth to the point where when I write story, a story that is the real truth, people will say, 
oh, you have to be making that up because that couldn't exist because I saw those movies. Right. You know, and so it, it was it was such a it's been such a joy to me when people say like, I wish this could have been true. And I'm like, it's the truth. <laughs> Lucky you. <laughs> what a joyous thing to present this hidden history. Yes. Um, it's like um, the idea around cowboys, that there were more black cowboys than people knew. I mean, that blew my mind when I discovered that. For sure. Uh, it's, it's a similar thing. So, yeah, it's it's amazing to hear about this um, diversity and also like what was possible, um, mm. you know, that these these women, these black women had access and and could be able to do that one for the u.s against canada definitely uh, <laughs> we'll take it we, we'll take our wins where we can get them absolutely Let's take it. What, a, what a brilliant what a joyful thing to be able to bring that history to the fore um you know through such a such a lively and, and beautiful work um, can i ask you to read uh just an excerpt from lone women so our audience can can hear what the book is like I'd be happy to. And so I, I I picked out a very short section that literally speaks to exactly what we just discussed to the surprising diversity of the place. Uh, and the only thing you really need to know for this small excerpt is our main character's name is Adelaide. She has fled from California to Montana. Um, uh, and she has brought with her nothing but a large steamer trunk. Um, she arrives in a town called Big Sandy, and then she gets a wagon ride uh, from Big Sandy to her homestead which is far far away from the town itself uh and along the way her and the wagon driver mr olson sit down and have a conversation and uh this is that conversation better to discuss something else one question of great importance importance did occur to her mr olson adelaide said uh, let me ask you this straight go ahead he said he eyed the beans bubbling on the fire had he eaten any of his meal yet Am I going to find any other Negroes out here? Adelaide asked. Mr. Olson coughed with surprise, not the question he'd expected. My home, Adelaide continued, we were all Negro farmers there, 27 families, Lucerne Valley, California. You heard of us? Mr. Olson thought on this, looking toward the distance. Can't say I have, he finally admitted, but I've never been to California. She felt disappointed, just slightly. They thought of themselves as big news in their own way. But what had she known of Montana before Maddie T. Kramer, a front page story in one person's life, might not even rate a line in the next person's newspaper. As for Negroes, Mr. Olson continued, since you're near Big Sandy, you'll meet Bertie eventually. Bertie, Adelaide repeated. Bertie Brown, he said. Annie Morgan used to be on the land, but she died. I think it was last year. She was farther south, down at Phillipsburg. Adelaide patted her thighs. Two Negroes, and uh, one of them is dead. Mr. Olson laughed at this. I guess you're right. He watched her a moment. You're worried about it? She sat quietly watching Mr. Olson's face. She knew that to reveal one's fears is to make oneself vulnerable. Finally, he spoke when she didn't. It's really the Chinese who get the horns out this way, Miss Henry. A lot of people don't like them. And the red man has few friends. I see, she said quietly. I'm not helping your peace of mind, am I? I wouldn't say so. He spooned more beans out of the can for her and she ate them from her cup. They were protected from the direct winds by the wall of the old hotel, but they would have to leave the shelter eventually. Adelaide let the beans sit on her tongue then swallowed them right away. When, she would, when would she have beans again? She couldn't be sure. She meant to savor these. When people need eat one another, they find ways to be good, Mr. Olson told her. I wish I could say better of the human animal, but I can't. He reached to his side and revealed a tin of dried peaches. This land is trying to kill every single one of us, let me tell you. And we keep each other alive. Your neighbors might not all welcome you, but I promise you they will help you if you need it. Because they will need you to help them eventually. For better or worse, that's the best I can give you. Lovely. Thank you so much for that uh, lively, dynamic reading. You can just mm -hmm. see that play out on the screen. It's so, <laughs> like, that's deliberate with you, right? It's so filmic already. It's just, well, I mean... It's uh, for the screen. <laughs> from your lips to some studio's ears. Hey, absolutely. <laughs> it's going to happen. I'm fantastic. Thank you so much, Victor. And, and Nora, a reading from you? Sure. Um, 
I'm going to be reading from The World We Make, which is the second book in the Great Cities. Um, the segment that I'm going to be reading is a very brief interlude in which we meet the personification of the city of London. Um, London is, is returning to herself, to her returning to the city of London after a brief drive-by visit to New York um, in order to kind of check on one of the characters who happens to be a Londoner who's just a student living in New York at the moment. Um, so, interruption, London. <clears throat> she reappears on her favorite bridge over the Thames, the Wobbly Bridge, also known as the Millennium Bridge. It doesn't wobble anymore, but that doesn't stop people from continuing to make fun of it affectionately, because that's what Londoners are like. A moment later, there is a flux and a flex, and New York appears beside her. He leans back on the railing, glances around at the few people crossing the span. It's full night here, not many about except folks stumbling home after drinks or late work, and then eyes her. Kind of rude rolling up in somebody's house without even saying hi. Oh, that! Lon London grins, delighted. Amazing that this slight, soft-spoken young fellow is a huge old city, but then others often say the same of her. I wasn't really there for you, but I suppose it was hypocritical of me, especially when the other elders are complaining about your rudeness as a city. I apologize. Satisfied with whatever you came to see? Oh, yes. I wanted to look at whatever you and your burrows have been dealing with. Your roommate was a convenient bellwether. <laughs> bellwether. Anyhow, nasty floating city you've got there. Right? Like a damn boil on my ass. Or a malignant tumor, given the way it's drawing such mm, problematic people to you. She could sense the enemy's influence on that Connell fellow, like the oily sheen left on water by a contaminant. No wiggly tendril to guide him within New York City limits, but then clearly none were needed. Relia citizens choose themselves. Anyhow, welcome. London gestures expansively at herself. I'd offer you tea, but I don't like tea anyway. She restrains a reflexive gasp, but, well, he is American. He falls silent for a while, absorbing the sounds and smells and glittering lights. Then he eyes her for a moment before speaking again. They tell me you crazy. <laughs> now, now, we're meant to use better language than that. Try mentally ill. Although, I'll admit my personal favorite is fucked in the head. He snickers. She grins. And I suppose I am, though, better than I was. Hard to shake a reputation once you've picked it up. He grunts in an agreeing sort of way. So how'd you eat them? Your burrows. Oh, right, that. Well, know how you have five burrows and counting? Imagine having 32. New York splutters. Fuck out of here. She chuckles. It wasn't that many. 32 only became official in the 1960s. Even at the time I instantiated, though, mm, 17th century or so, I can't remember exactly, but it wasn't long after Shakespeare's passing. London had a lot of distinctiveness between its now boroughs. Still does, I mean, but we're talking about then. So there were a lot of us when we first felt the city's call. Honestly, be glad you've only five. Our meetings were the stuff of nightmares. New York laughs, though there's an uncomfortable edge to it that tells London he understands from experience. And? And? She shrugs. Though in reality, it wasn't a shrug-worthy experience. Some of them didn't want to be London. We tried it for a time, fighting our own version of Squiggle Bitch for, year, for, for weeks on end. No talking, and uh, we didn't meet a humanish version of her anywhere, but it was, a blood, but it was bloody monster attacks every other min minute. Absolutely brutal. Composite cities give her a lot of opportunity, you see. London sighs. Anyhow, it finally became clear that some of us were never going to be fully on board, and without that, none of us would ever be safe from the enemy. So I said I would do it. I would be the one and only London. The others agreed, and so it was. But like New York pantomimes using a fork and knife. London can't help laughing. Oh my God, I'm not Sweeney Todd. I only ate their essence, the thing or things that made them an aspect of London. I took all that into myself. The city latched wholly onto me and me alone, and the others went back to their ordinary lives as ordinary people. Then I vanquished the enemy and did a little dance, and that was the end of it. 
Well, apart from me losing my mind for the next couple of centuries, because this city of all cities should never be just one person, but one does what one must. New York frowns, probably because he's trying to figure out what it would be like to suddenly take on the personalities and skills of so many other people. She hopes he never finds out. That's real fucked up, he says. They just left you to take on all that? She sighs. He's right, of course, but she's had a few centuries for forgiveness. We were strangers to each other, most of whom had families and lives beyond, li beyond being the city. Life was harder back then, remember. Plagues and war every other minute and the great fire. That happened when I went to mentor another city. Algiers, or was it Bucharest? Whichever, she almost killed me. Granted, I was very Jeanne de Arc, Jean of Arc Corps at the time, uh, dressing oddly, having visions, speaking in tongues, probably very alarming, but setting me on fire was just rude, don't you think? He stares. She thinks he's impressed and preens a little, brushing a lock of hair back over her shoulder. I don't know what I would do if the others didn't want to be New York, he says, chewing on his bottom lip as he contemplates it. I could do it, but of course you could do it. Cities pick primary avatars who can handle the job alone, if they must. But it's hard to be a whole city, especially cities as disparate as yours and mine. So sometimes our cities try to be kind to us. Spread the burden, give us a support network, that sort of thing. She sighs, remembering in spite of herself. Most of the other Londons had wanted to remain avatars, but it had not been an all-or-nothing thing. She misses them still. Never occurred to me to jettison one part and replace it, though. Not sure that would have worked here. London is particular about what counts as London. New York chuckles and says in a terrible imitation of her, one does what one must. Then he straightens and stretches. Not much to him in this form, but naturally there is a flicker and for an instant, London sees the truth of him. Neatly gridded blocks and decrepit subways and fancy rooftop wine bars that make her crave a, the comfort of a nice cozy pub. But he's got pubs too. Not many, but those few with the right spirit, sparkling like jewels amid the depths of him. Well then, they can be friends. Then he's just a skinny black youth again, lowering his arms and trying to work his way up to leaving with grace. Apparently he gives up on the grace part after a second or two. Well, I'm out. All right then. By the way, I'm going to tell the others to call a summit. It's unconscionable that they've let this situation continue unchecked. And if any of the elders give you any more trouble about it, you just let me know and I'll kill them and steal their stuff. The fuck? Well, I was the seat of the British Empire. She reaches <laughs> over and hits his cheek fondly, and he blinks. Now, now, I'm joking, dear. We don't do that anymore. With that, London heads off. The street market is probably still going, so she'll see if she can grab a kebab there. Then she's going to an old fashioned then she's going to do an old fashioned pub crawl because it's been too long. Talking to baby cities always puts her in a nostalgic mood. Behind her, New York stares for a moment longer, shakes his head, and then vanishes back home. Wow. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, that was both the an ode to cities, London and New York and the embodiments of those <laughs> cities. Uh, yeah, so complex, so, so complex, um, but but seamless as well. Um, just absolutely brilliant. Um, I wanna segue now uh, and ask you about labels and genre, how you both feel about that. Do you worry about genre? Are you, you know, conscious about the expectations of, labels do you think fantasy opens up the space for marginalized voices in ways that feel exciting and liberating because we have quite a few thriving um voices you know um the likes of Tommy Adeyemi who wrote Children of Blood and Bone uh, a British author here called Tade Thompson who's doing really interesting things Nendi Okorafa who I'm sure you both know uh River Solomon all bringing something different um and I think it's really needed and it's really encouraging. So I wondered how you both felt. Victor, you want to start? Yeah, um, sure. Uh, you know, I would say for me, so my path, my writing path, I beat my first two books were uh, like uh, realism, uh, really like personal stories about um, growing up in Queens and then 
family history in my first novel, that kind of thing. Um, but in a strange way, what I found was uh, this literary realism on some level I found um, was not capable for me, was, did not feel capable of actually talking about all of life as mm -hmm. I saw it. I felt like it was too limiting in a way. And also, if I'm honest, it was also just too depressing. Uh, like I was, or I was specifically focusing on the depressing stuff because I also felt like in that, when I was a newer writer, I thought the way that you prove you are a serious writer is you write about grim, terrible things all the time, right? Because that's what serious literature is. <laughs> um, and uh, and by two, with two, two books in, I've really hated writing and also if i'm being totally honest and crass and it also wasn't making me rich or famous so what was the point it was really my feeling like it's not in any way nourishing me right um and so for me uh i had to sort of sit down with myself after that second book and say well what would make you happy to write what would make you really feel good about writing and instantly i knew the answer was if i could put monsters in my work <laughs> Uh, nothing would make me happier. And as a kid who had grown up on horror and what fantasy and what might be called speculative fiction now, um, I kind of perked up in all these ways uh, at the thought. And I realized, um, number one, that, that that would make me happy. And what was missing for me from writing was joy. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and this can be such a grinding uh uh, sort of life to choose, right? Or, or art to choose or whatever, that um, why wouldn't I at least try to find a way to enjoy the grind a little bit, you know? Um, so for me, that that shift uh, was a like a, a an exciting leap. And the only question that came up, I, like I said, I've had the same editor the for a, a very long time for all my books, except my first one. And he had taken me on when I was this literary realist writer. And he had some trepidation about like, uh, you're switching to this now, this there this book about a secret society of black folks who are fighting a spiritual war in Oakland, California. Uh, what? You know, was kind of his take on that. And he was a little nervous about it, but um, he could tell I was much happier writing it. And more importantly, maybe, or or what also made him uh, re made him feel relieved was a lot more people read it than the previous ones, right? A lot more people embraced it. And um, what I think we both got to see was um, there was there were so many more readers who I think um, could both see the serious intent and the serious ideas that were in there, but also could enjoy the ride of it all right like could enjoy the, the the joy of the journey and the the and the um to Nora's point earlier the the invention the power of invention the power of coming up uh with uh if not entire worlds like uh uh touches of changes on, in the world that created moments of fantasy and surprise and horror and all the rest um and so for me that was kind of my journey into becoming the writer I am now which on some level I feel like was me finding the writer I was when I was 12. Mm. Like that kid, when I was 12, I was writing rip off Stephen King and Clive Barker stories. Um, and and no, no, nothing made me happier. And I kind of left that and learned some really useful things, but I had to come back to that and find that kid who just loved stories and mm. loved reading and say, I got some stuff. I think you might like it. You know, and I think he probably would have liked at least half my books, right? <laughs> Maybe not all, but at least half. And so I don't know if that quite answers the question, but I I I think um part of if things feel uh surprising or inventive or anything like that, on some level, it is because I've I really worked hard to tap back into that sense of play and that sense of joy. And then, but unlike what I saw when I was a kid that joy was black joy right mm -hmm. or in the case or it was multicultural joy if it's like in new york and doing all these different cultures at the same time and that was the thing that i hadn't seen when i was young and reading um and uh and i i feel so happy that like plugging into that and adding this other touch uh 
it feels like a moment where there's an audience who wants that, you know, versus I'm just imagine, you know, writers doing that 50 years ago. Even if they're doing it, you know, we look back now, we say, oh, oh they were a classic, but they were ahead of their time or something like that, or there wasn't enough an audience, or really there weren't enough publishers who saw the value to publish the thing and let it reach people. Uh, so I'm sorry, that was a meandering answer, but. No, that's a brilliant <laughs> answer. Um, yeah, so so much in that answer, actually. So finding, finding the joy and also, um, the sense of curiosity about what what's possible, um, what invention can look like, tapping into the childhood self, mm -hmm. um, and combining that with what excites your present self. You know, so um, yeah, there's so much in that that that's really encouraging for for um, aspiring writers who 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 will be in the audience listening in. Uh, thank you so much for that, Victor and Nora. How about you? Well, I mean, I never set out to be a, a serious writer. I, I I came into science fiction knowing full well I am a Black woman writing science fiction. At the time, there were, I think, two others. Uh, you know, Nettie, uh, 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 yeah, Nettie and Nalo Hopkinson. Oh, no, there were, there were four others. I'm sorry. <laughs> four whole others. Um, uh, but, you know, I just, I came into a field that I did not think was taken seriously. I did not expect to be taken seriously within it. Um, I have told the story before of how I really just started writing because a combination of I got frustrated with what I was seeing and realizing I can write as, as good as or better than this. Um, and uh, poverty and realizing <laughs> uh, that if I tried selling some some short stories, maybe I could get enough money to cover some bills. Um, and I did not expect to be uh, to to be successful. I did not expect to get taken seriously. I didn't expect anybody to read my stuff. <laughs> so that was kind of fun. Um, for me, though, what it really boils down to is, you know, I, I see it like the difference between, modifying existing clothing to come up with an interesting new costume and creating that costume from cloth and pattern and scratch. Um, you know, I can do so much more with it. I can make it look better if I can manipulate the world and the society and the characters um, versus just trying to depict the reality that I see. Um, so I, I've, I've never had any urge to write realism. Um, beyond the realism that's embedded in my stories. I've never had the urge to write just pure realistic stuff. Um, so I can't really speak to the contrast of that. But for me, it is the reason I've never had that urge is because, you know, I think like you, Victor, I, I look at it and I realize there's so much more you can do if you if you change it from the ground up. Mm -hmm. um, so that's it. Yeah, that's that's a wonderful response. I love that you said modifying existing mm -hmm. clothing. what a beautiful way um to express that also you know being one of few black women in that space in some ways did that give you a sense of freedom because there's so there were so few of you at the time it's like oh well I can kind of do what I want you know um I don't really have a lens on me in that sense so perhaps, was there was there an element of that you no, know, I was hyper aware that there was a lens on me, but I just knew that that lens didn't expect much. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, the, there's, a, there's a racism of low expectations that you learn to get used to when you're an American Black person. Um, you know, people are always surprised that you can talk. Um, you know, you're so articulate, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Um, they're surprised you can talk, that you can walk and, and chew gum at the same time. Um, so, you know, I, I did not expect uh, to, I, I just knew that I wanted to write certain things and I did not care what other people would think of me because I knew they wouldn't think much. Um, you know, there would be some who do, who did, but, you know, I was coming into a genre that had a long and storied history of, um, you know, kind of patronizing black authors when they pointed out the disparities and the and the poor handling of um reality in in the science fictional worlds and fantasy and st fantastical worlds that existed out there um there's a a uh, race in sf essay that samuel delaney wrote 
um, I forget the specific year, it was in the 60s, but uh, I believe it was the 60s, um, where he's pointing out the exact same problems that I, as a modern Black science fiction writer, had been dealing with. Um, and it was very polite. It was a very reasoned and, and careful and detailed case. Um, and you can see that no one paid attention to it. They just simply ignored it. Um, you know, and and so when I in the the 2010s and other right black writers started making the same case for, um, you know, we're not seeing fantasy worlds that look like reality. Um, we're seeing endless depictions of fantastical medieval Europe that don't contain any brown or black people. Um, and we're seeing depictions of modern Europe that uh, <laughs> modern uh, the the modern UK that don't contain any brown or black. Right. Um, you know, and it just, I wasn't expecting, I didn't expect much of the genre, and I didn't think that the genre would expect much of me. So that created a freedom, and I suppose it's the freedom of contempt. Uh, I don't <laughs> want to make it sound terrible, <laughs> but but it's the freedom of, you know, okay, you know, you do what you're going to do. I'm going to do what I do. We'll see what happens. Um, and then surprise, I'm a MacArthur, an award winner, and a bunch <laughs> of things. Happen. I wasn't expecting that. Um I'll take it. That's so amazing. It's it's phenomenal. Take it. Um, yeah. the take freedom it. of the freedom of contempt. And yeah, how, I, I don't know if that's a good way to phrase that. But, <laughs> how but an honest one. Uh, you know, it is what it is. Yeah. It's a very, very honest one. Um, before we go to audience questions, I want to just um lastly ask you both. Uh, do you see your works as blueprints for social change? And if so, in what ways? Um, Victor, I'm gonna come to you first. Um, like how well, can be considered forms of activism, you know, within the genres um, right. that you guys operate in? Yeah. Well, I guess in in a in a way uh, to what Nora just said, like I think there's um, something. It seems almost so basic that it shouldn't need to be said or something, but there's something so basic about asserting a reality that the dominant majority can't imagine exists or doesn't care if it exists or doesn't want it to exist yes uh and um and the uh, like in a in a strange way like one of the most powerful things one can do is assert one's reality and then uh communicate that to other folks who also recognize that reality right and uh and, uh and in that way um what you get to, like, I think sometimes I think about the the old model of, say, publishing, let's say, right, uh, which was that there were much fewer houses, much fewer editors, and the people who sat in those positions were on some level, and the people who ran magazines that ran uh, that ran stories were on some level um, making choices about what reality the any genre agreed upon. Right. And that that reality would skew almost without fail to the bias of the person sitting in that chair. Right. And um, the beauty on some level of at least this moment, I don't want to say the modern age because we could because uh, whole segments of the population are trying to claw back the modern age to 100 years ago uh, uh, all the time. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, but the glory of at least this moment in the modern age is uh, not just that, uh, say, that writers like Nora, myself, and, and any number of the folks that we've named could um, could exist and write our stories. But I think the even more powerful thing is to see them gain purchase in the larger cultural conversation so that they can't be erased and so that people come after and be like, well, I can do my own world building. I can create my own 10, 10 book world building series and i know i can do it because i read the broken earth trilogy like mm -hmm. so that that because so that it becomes not just one e explosive powerful work but that it it builds like i can't even i'm so excited on some level to see the generations after who get to say like oh no no what you all did that was great but now there's 40 of us 60 mm -hmm. of us 80 of us and we not only create the work, we have jobs as editors, we run our own small presses, we run, we work as execs at TV studios, radio, uh, radio state, like the way that that can build out. And on some level, um, we can fight for an assertion of that reality 
that we all share and that there will be other people who will assert their realities that we didn't see mm -hmm. and that that's beautiful. Uh, so, I mean, in that sense, I feel like it's a blueprint for what yeah. can come. Yeah, that's really positive and a, a beautiful way to, <laughs> to express what could be possible. Like, you know, let's manifest that from your from your mouth to the universe, mm. um, as they say, that that those things start to happen. We certainly need more uh, black and um, persons of color editors uh, in those positions, um, you know, who know what's possible. Um, who know that that innovation is there uh, and are in uh, in positions to kind of uh, give those opportunities to to writers who have those voices and want to do exciting things. So hopefully that can happen. Um, Nora, I'll, I'll, I'm going to come to you. Mm -hmm. um, I I don't think of art as activism. I think that art works in concert with activism. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that artists can dream up realities as they are, can, can rewrite um, those, those consensus realities that Victor was saying that, you know, sort of power brokers tend to try and control and, and filter through their own biases. Um, art can, can fight that. Art can push against that vision um, and create a, a new consensus reality, a new zeitgeist. Um, but, you know, the activists are the ones who go forth and enact that in the real world. The, the activists are the ones who make it become a thing. Um, and I think that um, I have learned from activists and I would hope that uh, activists have, you know, I've been told by some activists that they've gained something uh, from just seeing possibilities that exist in art. Um, and I think that that, you know, that is how it's supposed to work. Uh, my father is a visual artist, uh, Noah Jemison, and he taught me as I was growing up that, uh, you know, and, and this is, there are many paraphrases of this particular quote, um, but the, the duty of the artist is to speak truth to power. Um, the power will push back. The truth will be debatable, um, but you filter the truth through yourself just as other people are doing as well. Um, and if your voice is strong enough and powerful enough, you can make a difference in in what everyone is seeing. Um, and so that's the thing I'm trying to do. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And speaking, not only speaking truth to power, but speaking truth to power in subversive, experimental, bold ways, which you both do so, so wonderfully. Um, so thank you so much for that. Uh, we have some audience questions now. Uh, a question from Jude. How do you feel about worlds in which a population is considered to be a homogenous non-white race? Can this be done well? And should writers always strive to diversify populations? That's the question from Jude. Are, if you're talking about humans, that's that's an artificial world where a small population of isolated people was deposited and not allowed to migrate um, because uh, physical diversity among human beings is a response to environment. If they live on that planet, if they spread over that planet, if they move beyond the, 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 the solar radiation zone that they're in, they're going to begin to differentiate. They're going to develop darker or lighter skin. You know, they're, they're going to develop different ways of processing uh, the air, if they're in more, uh, you know, high altitude places, you can't have a population like that in any kind of world that makes sense by the laws of physics that we know. So that's my thought about that. Anyway. Wonderful. No, that answers that um, perfectly, I think. Uh, yeah. Victor, we have a question from Danielle. Uh, when creating new worlds and new cities, how do you create that sense of depth and unique culture that you do so well with stories set in cities in the real world. Uh, well, I I mean I think the um, the beauty of fiction on some level, right, is that you the, the fact that we're not writing nonfiction is inevitably in the history of any city, the geography of any city or any place, there are going to be gaps and spaces, right? Uh, we can't answer everything, we can't know everything, and that those are exactly the places where it's very easy to just drop in or invent something new, you know, to create a whole other neighborhood in the middle of Queens, to create a uh, a secret underground city uh, below Oakland, uh, whatever it might be. Um, the, the, the joy of it is, uh, I think, knowing a place well allows you to figure out then what you can invent about that place. If you're, you, if you're using a real place, like I have 
usually done uh, versus, I mean, the other side of that is the joy of truly wholly inventing a place, I imagine, is then, then you are in charge of all of it. Mm -hmm. And no one can tell you you're wrong about your city. <laughs> you're also, you're also I decided I'm never possible. writing in the real world again. I'm so sorry. <laughs> what did you say? Well, I would say you also all the weight falls on you as well. You are solely responsible for, for sure. the fiction of, of that city too, you know. Uh, yeah, because as we know, sometimes um, uh, people, readers and people can be sensitive to things. Say, oh, you, were you describing my city? I'm not sure that that was completely accurate. You yes. know, I'm not sure. <laughs> There's always one, isn't there? <laughs> I Actually, you know, I, I could... ever writing in the real world again. <laughs> I, tell you, I, I, I think there's a, a funny story about... Uh, Oakland like um so uh, a previous novel the one I mentioned where I like finally added monsters this novel Big Machine it takes place in Oakland California but I knew I was gonna have and it was my love letter to there having lived there for a few years but I knew I was gonna have um uh the 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 antagonist of the story essentially like um recruits uh uh more destitute people and essentially has them start blowing themselves up around the city and blowing up parts of the city right blowing up uh the east bay bridge and the and on and on and on so i was a little worried about like well i i don't know how that's going to sit for people um me really naming these real places so i changed the name of the city to garland california it says near oakland but it's Garland. And then I changed the names of the like the the Bay Bridge and the this and this. But then the funny thing was the book came out and I did the reading in Oakland. And a couple of people came up and they said, it's obvious that it was Oakland, right? And then they and I said, yeah. And then they said, why didn't you blow up Oakland? I want to see Oakland get blown up. I'm from Oakland. And it was such a funny moment where That's I was so like, funny. oh, I oh, should yeah. have done it. Yeah. You should have. <laughs> it was smart I to change it. It was smart yeah. to change it because you know either way there might be some criticism. I mean, either way, but I felt like these were like real Oakland people, and they were like, "Blow up the Bay Bridge. <laughs> let's let's just see it." They were they were down for that. That is absolutely yes. brilliant. I'm hilarious. Um, Laura, I have a question from Rebecca. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a master student doing English literature fantasy at the University of Glasgow. I'm doing a presentation on the killing moon um, of the dream blood duology in a few weeks. I have, I have a question to ask um, Nora, would you like to say anything to anyone being introduced to your work for the first time? <laughs> anything that you would like them to keep in mind when reading your work? Specific to the dream blood, I wonder? Hmm. Um... I want people to not expect anything when they come into my work. Um, you know, I, I hope that I will always provide uh, plausible uh, created worlds and, and plausible people to inhabit them. Um, but I don't want to be known for any specific, like a thing that I do all the time. Um, you know, and, and I think that's one of the reasons why my various uh, series have ranged so widely in sort of in, in terms of topic. Um, I, I get bored with the same topic. I want to do something new and strange every time. Um, and and I want readers who come to my work uh, to start reading and be like, what the hell has she come up with this time? What the hell is she doing this time? Should I stick with her? Or, you know, is this a good idea? If, if people have that question, I'm happy. <laughs> um, and the answer will sometimes be no. I like her dream blood books, but I don't like her inheritance books or, you know, or I like the comic book, but I don't like the, the broken earth, you know, I mean, and that's fine. I want to, my mind is, is, it ranges widely over a lot of different subject matters. And if one thing that I'm doing doesn't make people happy, that's fine. Maybe something else that I do will. Yeah, absolutely. And there's such a breadth and scope to your work, like you said. It's really hard to pigeonhole you. Um, right. And that keeps things interesting because, mm -hmm. you know, like you said, you don't want to get bored and you yeah. want to keep challenging yourself. You know, as writers, we have to keep seeking those things that keep us excited you know keep us um uh curious about being in that fictive space and the worlds that we can build question mm -hmm. for victor uh from jamie 
Do you believe that in the future, there's going to be more people writing about the real history uh, and possibly even more films that show the retelling of history as merely white will change back to a sort of retelling of history as it actually was, namely more diverse than we're thinking about today. I mean, you touched on this earlier when you were talking mm -hmm. about lone women and the, the true history, the real history that people weren't aware of. But yeah, he's essentially, I think, asking you to expand a little bit on that. Well, yeah, I, I guess I, I would say just, I hope, I certainly hope so, uh, right? Like uh, I, uh, I, I can never get enough of just that, uh, you know, speaking of this, just yesterday, I think I was listening to uh, the NPR podcast. I feel so terrible because I can't remember the woman's name and her book, but it was a black woman who had written a novel, I mean, sorry, written a nonfiction account of a very, a particular asylum um, in this, in the States, in, in, it was in the South. I, I wish I could even remember where exactly it was, uh, that began in the uh, early 1900s. And it had, um, there was essentially like a, a black side of the asylum, a white side of the asylum. And part of the, and part of the book was talking about, um, the sort of miscarriage of justice of things, uh, and the ways that essentially the, particularly the, specifically the black folks who were forcibly put into the asylum were then used at, much like with prison lab labor to to be free labor for local business, right? Um, but um, we, then she got into the specifics of a handful of people, like why they were committed. And one of the stories that really stayed myth with me was a British, a black British, man who came to the states to work as a jockey uh and for whatever reason the job ended or he lost the job and he ended up living in that city on the streets um and he was arrested and put in the asylum for years because he had a british accent and they said there's no way this is real oh good grief. he must be mentally ill what? And so, and the only reason he was uh, discovered and then finally freed was uh, this asylum eventually at some point hired a black woman as one of its staff. And she was going through basically like, who are all the people? Why are they here? And then she met this dude and this dude had been in there for years saying, I am a British man. I have mm -hmm. not lost my mind because I'm talking this way. Mm -hmm. And, and so to me, like, I was already like, all right, I want that show. I want that book. I want to read her nonfiction book. And I feel terrible. I can't remember the title of it. But um, the, I mean, I that sense of like a history is so, you know, uh, uh, it seems silly to say it, but it's so rich and so complicated. Going back to cliche, the idea of cliches, that uh, there are so many tales to be told about the complexity of this world, right? In in every in every meaning of that term right whatever complexity like even down to like within one a single family right and the uh everybody's a brunette but there's this one kid who's a redhead and <laughs> but we never talk about why you know and then the neighbor across the street is a redheaded family you go ah, you know <laughs> no, no. what can we do <laughs> you know and uh but i i love the idea of all of that being explored from the most personal level, but the way that going back to that idea of like um, advocacy, that like just telling the truth about how complex the world is, I think is a form of advocacy mm -hmm. and a form of is is a political act. Absolutely, and like you said, there are so many stories to tell. Uh, yeah. Like even reality can sometimes be stranger than fiction. Just telling For sure. the truth, you know, bringing things um, stories to the forefront. Um, thank you, Victor. There's a question from Maisha. Um, uh, Nora, I'll ask you this. I wonder if you could speak to the role of fantasy in helping to urge and or achieve, okay, we just touched on this, a social change, given the US is facing re-electing Trump again, uh, so there's a political aspect to this. Uh, mm -hmm. It seems like Americans in particular and the world in general are determined to stay in its vicious, violently hateful cycles, um, a very gothic existence. How can fantasy help us get to a different tomorrow? Well, I mean, I think it all goes back to rewriting reality. Like I said, 
You know, the, what, what's happening in the U.S. right now is probably the biggest concoction of fantasy that I've ever seen. <laughs> um, yes. A lot of these folks are trying to literally rewrite the the moment that we're living in. Um, you know, the, the sky is blue and they're insisting that it's polka dot um, and people believe them. And the, the media is reprinting this you know, Republicans say sky is polka dot um, <laughs> instead of sky is not polka dot. Republicans are not. You know, this is what we all need to be saying. Yeah, but we, we are we are living in this concoction of reality right now that is not being questioned enough, that is not being pushed back on, I think, enough. Um, and and the 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 energy behind it is powerful forces with a lot of money are doing their absolute best to impose their hallucination on all of us. And I think that the role of the fantasy writer right now is to show that this is a hallucination by depicting other hallucinations, <laughs> just as Kafka. And, yeah. you know, okay, you think this guy is polka dot? How about I put a big eye in it? Whatever, you know. <laughs> I think that it is, it is, um, there's there's two things that you have to do. One is, um, when, like I said, when I'm writing, I try to make sure that I get the the realism, where there is realism, I try to get it right. I get the people um, as accurate as I can. I use my own experiences uh, as a former career counselor, um, you know, and just sort of going into what people's uh, real ways of interacting with each other are like. I read real history. I try to catch those same little stories that Victor is finding uh, that people have carefully elided and carefully tried to uh, write out of existence. You bring those stories back. You you push the the reality in the places where people want fantasy, and then you give them a different fantasy. Um, so I, I don't know that I'm making a great deal of sense, but um, you know, in a world where everyone is just making up hogwash, <laughs> make up better hogwash, <laughs> um, and, then, and then you season it with a heavy uh, component of reality. Right. You and you, you you mix reality and fantasy, essentially, <laughs> the fantastical. I mean, they are. Ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> doing it to you. Them. Exactly. They're doing it too. Yeah. You might as well they at least be it. a better entertainer in the process. That's right. Absolutely. And didn't Octavia Butler um, foresee a Trumpian president in Parable oh. of the Sower? I mean, she was like a soothsayer, like a lot of this stuff, climate change, Trump, that was predicted in that, you know, that book. So it's it's really interesting that these things are coming to pass yeah. um, and we are essentially witness to them. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah. Yeah, it's fascinating. Last question from an amazing writer we have in the UK called Leonie Ross. Um, I'll ask you this question, Victor. Um, Leonie says, does a creator of worlds have to be a sensualist? Is mm -hmm. that where it begins in smell and sound and color and texture? Or is the care of world building something else for you? Oh, that's such a Leonie question. Mm. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, she's ah. brilliant. That's a great question. I mean, I, in a way, I wonder um, within that question, like a, almost like a the idea of like, well, how does one access this world, right? How does one access the world? And I imagine that will determine, like, so I would imagine that this writer is a sensualist, is a person who sees and thinks this way, right? And so uh, I would say definitely for you, Yes, right. Uh, and I only say that to uh, I, I don't mean to be flip about it, but I mean more like uh, um, I was amazed when I when I listened to something that came out a couple of weeks ago. I talked about the idea that um, uh, only what is it, 40 or 60 percent of the population has an interior voice, mm -hmm. right? That 40 percent, at least 40 percent of the people walking around are not in constant dialogue with themselves in their heads. They're not constantly talking through their steps and their moments and they're all the rest. And you might as well have told me uh, they just discovered the cities on Jupiter to hear that. <laughs> it is so foreign to my understanding of life because even as we're even, even as I'm talking now, there's the voice in my head saying, like, just wrap this up, buddy. Let's go. Let's go. You know what I mean? Like uh, it's always on. 
Uh, and so your voice is a rude Queens person. Is that what's absolutely, oh it is. It's like, yeah, yeah, this is good, but we got to move it on. That's uh, that's we the inner voice. <laughs> we got things to do. But um, but uh, I only mean that to say that I think the beauty of the creative process of the writing process is that every single writer, I hope it doesn't sound like a cop out, but every single writer, their mind, their way that they access the world is the way that they access creating worlds, right? Uh, and the idea of saying that there's any one way would strike me as so debilitating to 99.9% .9 of all the other writers who are creating. So, uh, so my answer would be yes, and also, and yes to all the other choices as well, right? Um, and and for me personally, like uh, I think the way I access almost everything is through the physical. Like I always have to know what is the body that is moving through the world, and that is going to determine how they understand the world. Are they someone who are they a bigger person, and they have to think about the world in that way? Are they a person who has to worry about threats? Or are they a person who moves through the world without fear of threats? Are they a person who can walk through almost any neighborhood and and in, in essence be unseen, meaning be left alone? Or are they someone who has to always be thinking, what's the tenor of this neighborhood? What's the tenor of this block? Can I walk around safely? And that in that way, like I start to build out my worlds through the bodies of the people moving through them. Because on some level, that is how I think. That's how I access the world all the time um so i, I feel like that's a non-answer answer no it's a great answer but essentially yes to sensual writing if if that's how you tap into the writing space but also yes to the multiplicities yes uh, of, of what writing can be for different people and and, and work in ways that speak to you you know it's essentially a, a space of play isn't it i think that's what you're saying and and it's good to kind of lean in lean into that whatever that feels like for you as a writer um who you as they say do you. yeah do absolutely you. do you um i'm afraid we've come to the end of our time we i could talk to you guys for an extra two hours there's so much to say and mine and explore um but thank you so much for being um incredibly generous with your time it's been a very very robust um and enriching conversation from two of our, of our most vital writers um i feel we've been very privileged to have you join us uh, for Black to the Future Festival. Um, huge thanks to our audience for joining us and to our partners, the Royal Society of Literature and the British Library um, for supporting us um, during this festival and for this event specifically. Uh, yeah, thank you everyone and take care. Join us for some more Black to the Future events coming up. <laughs>